This is our grand finale, so take it away. Thanks. This is the last of six lectures on the Nobel Prizes of 2022. And today, we're going to be talking about the kind of oddball one, though you could consider economics oddball as well. And this is the Peace Prize. And the Peace Prize, uh, let me, I'm ready. I press, yeah, okay. There we are. Peace Prize, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the Peace Prize and then talk about uh, or have have the laureates and others talk about um, the, the prizes of 2022. If you remember from previous talks, the medal is different. And that's why we illustrate it here from the other Nobel Prize medals. They have a kind of a more abstract portrait of Alfred Nobel and they have three guys in dancing a troika or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, so um, the Nobel Peace Prize in no Alfred Nobel's will uh, said it would be awarded to the person who in the preceding year shall have done the most or the best work for fraternity between nations for the abolition or reduction of standing armies and for the holding and promotion of peace congresses. And that was, of course, written uh, in his will of 96. Um, the Nobel Peace Prize is awarded by the Norwegian Nobel Committee, consisting of five persons who are chosen by the parliament of Norway. And this is what makes it extraordinary because when he set up his will, uh, Norway was part of Sweden. So why did Alfred Nobel choose Norway and not Sweden? So there's some guesses, we don't know for sure. Nobel may have considered Norway better suited to awarding the prize as it did not have the same militaristic traditions of Sweden. In this day and age, we think of Sweden, the great neutral country during World War I and World War II. But back in the 17th century, it was an enormous power. And when I visited Stockholm, they have one of this enormous battleship, the Vasa, that um, was launched and immediately sunk. It was a very big ship. And because it immediately sank, we have all sorts of information about 17th century Sweden uh, because they sank with many of their crew on board. So we know a lot about their medicine, et cetera. And if you're in Stockholm, it's an amazing museum. They have pulled the boat up somewhere in the 1970s, 60s or 70s, and it's been well preserved in the anaerobic harbor uh, of, um, of Stockholm. Anyway, it was a militaristic country. And also at the end of the 19th century, the Norwegian parliament had to be involved had been involved with efforts to resolve conflicts, mediation and arbitration. So, as I point here, Norway was ruled in union with Sweden and dominant Sweden until it declared its own independence in 1905 and changed the capital city from Christiana to Oslo. Um, so the, I wanted to show uh, just this is amusing to me in 2015, uh, they allowed people to vote on their favorite Peace Prize winner and uh, and the third most popular was Mother Teresa. She won it in 1979. Notice several winners in the past were people who weren't directly related to war but brought uh, comfort to the poor. And, uh, and so she was one of those. Uh, Malala won in 2014, and last seen at the Academy Awards, if you had tuned in. And the winner of the popular contest was Martin Luther King, who won the Nobel Prize in 1964. Uh, and he, 
we'll get back to King briefly. So several factoids I want to go through initially, and then we'll get to this year's uh, uh, um, Nobel Prize winners. There were no Mo Nobel Prize prizes given in 19 years over its over the century and a quarter, roughly, that it was given. And some are natural. World War I, it wasn't given in 1914, 15, 16, and 18. What happened to 1917? Well, as I'll tell you later, it was given to the Red Cross, who was dealing with both sides. Several other years don't have explanations. Perhaps the committee just couldn't make up its mind. And then World War II came, and again, 1939 through 1943, no awards were given. But World War II ended in 1945. Can you guess who got the Nobel Prize in 1944? The Red Cross, again. So they won it twice, and then one more later on. In 1948, they had decided finally, after several nominations starting in the 1930s, to give the award to Mahatma Gandhi. But they didn't quite decide it in time to give it to him because he was assassinated the very year. And so they gave it to no one, considering that it was there's no possible person who could match his contribution to peace. And then several other years were missed. Four American presidents have won. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, 1906, for settling the Russo-Japanese War, uh, even though he had a big stick. Uh, Woodrow Wilson from World War I, where we saved the Europeans um, uh, in, in a variety of ways. Jimmy Carter in 2002, a very aspirational one of Barack Obama in 2009, and one vice president, uh, Al Gore, won in 2007 for his environmental initiatives. Some, usually, not all, oftentimes, it was just a single winner, but there were some pairs of winners or even triplets, and they usually related to one another. Not always, but there's some here I wanted to mention. Henry Kissinger and Le Doctor Doc won in 1973 after the resolution of the Vietnam War. And Le Doctor was the only winner that ever declined the award. Uh, and you can talk about the politics of that, but, uh, and Henry Kissinger, knowing what he did in South America, is uh, anyway, whatever. The next pair that I mentioned here was after the uh, Suez War, in which uh, a settlement was made between Egypt and Israel in 1978. Nelson Mandela and Frederick Willem de Klerk, uh, after the end of apartheid, won it jointly. And Yasser Arafat. Uh, Itzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres won in 1994. Uh, oftentimes, these joint, uh, joint winners is somewhat controversial. We get to we'll get to that in a little while. This is the only Nobel Prize that can be won by organizations or institutions. And when you think of all the science awards, reducing the number, the maximum number that can win an, a, a Nobel Prize in one year is three, as I mentioned earlier. You can imagine now that so much of science is collaborative that if you mentioned the uh, institution, you know, National Institutions of Health, NIH or something, they, they are organizations that conceivably should be given such an award, but that was not how it was described by Alfred Nobel. So, as I mentioned, the International Red Cross won it during World War I and World War II, and also in 1963, and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees has won it twice. 
Um, all the rest are single. And I'm just going to show a list. I don't expect you to spend the time reading them all, but I will point out uh, several organizations here. Um, Amnesty International in 1977, and I found a local, I founded a local branch of, of that uh, here in Gainesville <laughs> years ago. Doctors Without, Without Frontiers, so, uh, and um, uh, organizations uh, such as, uh, and we'll come back to this in a minute, the Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet, consisting of several organizations uh, in Tunisia. Um, and it also includes the two of the three winners of this year's Nobel Prize. Uh, there have been controversies in awarding the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, first of all, the nominations, and this is true of all nominations for all Nobel Prizes, uh, uh, are restricted at who can nominate or who they accept nominations from. And obviously in physics, uh, it's oftentimes uh, uh, departments of physics, major uh, uh, former Nobel laureates. In peace, members of governments, both legislative and uh, executive, Academics in the proper fields of international studies, of history and social sciences, previous recipients, past and present members of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, etc. And they are then winnowed. Is there two ends in winnowed? Doesn't look right. Um, to pick the, the winner. Nominations are released. Those, the nominations that have been made in the past for all Nobel Prizes are held secret for 50 years. So right now we're discovering the nominations for the 1973 prizes are released. So when someone says, I was nominated for the Peace Prize, as some politicians do, we won't know for 50 years if that was uh, uh, the case. Just the Peace Prize and all of them, all, all six prizes. All nominations are held secret for 50 years. Uh, the Nobel Prizes for Physics, Chemistry, and Physiology, this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica, have generally been the least controversial. Though there have been cases in which science has uh, ultimately disproved some of the discoveries found in, in, in this, especially in medicine physiology, as you can imagine. But uh, Generally, they're least controversial. Why? Because science is self-correcting, or at least ideally, it's self-correcting. Whereas those for literature and peace have been, by their very nature, the most exposed to critical differences. The Peace Prize has been the prize most frequently reserved or withheld. We'll talk a little bit about that. Economics fits into it in, a, in certain ways because there are several competing and distinctive economic models now. So you get Milton Friedman on the one hand, on one side, and Keynes on another, and, and they don't see uh, the world. And it suggests that, as someone mentions, economics is a dismal science because it's really not all that much a science in which uh, conclusive tests can be run. Uh, and even science sometimes is false that. Some overlooked people, and there are lots of them, but I mentioned two or three here. Eleanor Roosevelt, who, who was so instrumental at the beginning of the United Nations with the Declaration of Rights that she put together. Vaclav Havel, the playwright, but the leader of uh, Czech independence, uh, uh, is thought to be one overlooked. And of course, Mahatma Gandhi, again, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's, it's interesting that he was nominated from the mid 1930s, but uh, the independence of India and Pakistan didn't occur till 1947 and 48. And so it uh, unfortunately, someone assassinated him. I, I 
think a Hindu radical, but I don't want to, I don't remember. Some recent disappointments, I want to mention too, that was kind of disappointing. The, 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 prime, uh, the president of Ethiopia won, uh, uh, won for uh, finally resolving a war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And then he became president. He wasn't the president at the time of, uh, or the prime minister, but I think the president of Ethiopia. And they've had a civil war, a brutal civil war, of which he represents one side and the Tigray rebels on the other. And he was anything but a, a, uh, a mediator and a, uh, uh, a peace loving person in that civil war. And I mentioned the Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet. That quartet was a group of institutions, including labor unions and a parliamentary committee, et cetera, that in, in 2013, uh, early on in the Arab Spring, had resolved uh, uh, the uh, government in Tunisia and reached a more democratic uh, end. But recent news out of Tuni Tunisia says that uh, the leader now is as autocratic and dictatorial as they've had in, in ever. So it's a disappointment. But at the time, these winners were deserving. Um, and some, as I mentioned earlier, are kind of aspirational. And I think having uh, a Barack Obama, even, even Obama was surprised at winning the Nobel Peace Prize, but he didn't turn it down, which is, I think, all right. And finally, many awards have been criticized as politically motivated by, uh, by the Norwegian legislature and Norway itself and uh, oftentimes reflects the prevailing progressive democratic supporting essence of Norway, which is often uh, criticized, but uh, I think it's admirable anyway. Okay, wanted to talk about this year's three winners. Two of, one of them was an individual, is an individual, uh, and his name is Alice Bialista, Bia, Bialias, whatever. That's his name printed up there, born in 1962 from Belarus. And two organizations, the Russian Human Rights Organization Memorial and the Ukrainian Human Rights Organization, the Center for Civil Liberties. And what I've done today is to combine several videos that uh, will describe the significance of their um, prize winning. And the first one, as in, I, is going to show some of the ceremonial nature of the ceremony awarding the winners. And it takes place in Oslo at the same hour as the awards are given in Stockholm. And I want you to appreciate the distinction between a Norwegian event and a Swedish event, uh, which is dramatic. And uh, so this is the ceremony this year, this last uh, December 10th, and um, we'll I'm going to start it and uh, Julianne is going to take us to the beginning of the ceremonial portion. All right. 9.33. And uh, the laureates are now on their way into the hall. First in the procession is the wife of the Belarusian prize winner Alice Bialyatsky, Natalia Pinchuk. She walks with the deputy leader of the Nobel Committee. 
Number two here is Jan Raczynski from Russian Memorial. And next in line, Oleksandra Marichuk from the Center for Civil Liberties in the Ukraine, accompanied by other members of the Nobel Committee. And they will now find their places on the podium where they will stand until the royal family has arrived. the royals his majesty majesty king hada leads the procession with true to tradition the leader of the Mo nobel committee Berit Ras Andersen, and the mayor of oslo her majesty queen sonia is accompanied by the secretary of the nobel committee and behind them the royal highness crown prince Håkon and crown princess mette marit And it's now time for the leader of the Nobel Committee, Berit Reis Andersen, to give her speech to the laureates and to the world. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, Nobel Peace Prize laureates, Ladies and gentlemen, at this very moment in Stockholm, Nobel Prizes are being presented to this year's Nobel laureates in physiology or medicine, physics, chemistry and literature under the provisions of Alfred Nobel's will. All the Nobel Prizes, including the Peace Prize, are interconnected. The vision of Alfred Nobel was one of progress through science and the search for truth and greater knowledge. It was also a vision of profound literature, enlightening and feeding the spirit, and of peace, which is so essential for safety and prosperity. Alfred Nobel's support of science, literature and peace reflect his conviction that those pursuits were the keys to a better world. At the core of his vision was the belief that talented and committed individuals can make a difference. I have the immense pleasure this year of recognizing Ales Bialyatsky, the Organization Memorial, and the Center for Civil Liberties as the champions of peace, who, by different means but for a common goal, have conferred the greatest benefit to humankind. For this, each is being awarded a one-third share of the Nobel Peace Prize for 2022. When announcing our decision in October, the Norwegian Nobel Committee emphasized that the three laureates have promoted the right to criticize power and protect the fundamental uh, rights of citizens. They have made an outstanding effort to document war crimes, human rights abuses, and abuse of power together 
they demonstrate the significance of civil society for peace and democracy. A democratic government needs not only the support of its people, but also criticism, new ideas and new perspectives. Its ultimate source of authority is the people. History teaches us that even suppressed people will at some point defy the oppressor. Somebody will form a movement and speak up for more freedom, justice, democracy, and rule of law. These rights and values are the framework that guarantees every citizen the right to hold an opinion and enjoy freedom of speech and freedom of organization. Our three laureates share this conviction. They have a common approach to exposing oppression and perpetrators of war crime. Their method is to systematically collect evidence of past and current human rights violations and war crimes. The purpose is to hold perpetrators accountable, to honor the victims, and to prevent the repetition of atrocities. Reliable evidence is of vital importance, not only for a legal process, but also for historical documentation and moral restoration of the victim's perspective. This brings me to the first of our three laureates, Ales Bialyatsky. The Belarusian government has for years tried to silence him. He has been harassed, he has been arrested and jailed, and he has been deprived of employment. Mr. Bialyatsky is by profession a scholar of literature, and words have been his weapon ever since he was one of the initiators of the democracy and human rights movement in Belarus in the 1980s. He is the founder of Viasna, an organization that initially documented abuse against protesters, but soon developed into a human rights organization. For more than 20 years, Viasna has documented abuse and torture against activists and political opponents of the dictatorship in Belarus. The organization identifies victims, keeps track of where they are serving sentences, and monitors their treatment. In July 2021, all of Yasna's offices were searched, and <clears throat> its leaders were arrested. At this moment, our thoughts are with all prisoners of conscience in Belarus, and most particularly, we think of Ales Bialyatsky in his dark and isolated prison cell in Minsk. And Ales, you are not alone. We stand with you, and we thank your wife, Natalia Pinchuk, who will see soon receive the gold medal and diploma on your behalf. Mr. Bialyatsky insists that he is not a politician. His role is to promote human rights, democracy, and rule of law, a dangerous task in a dictatorship. He is now facing a possible sentence of seven to 12 years in prison. The novelist Milan Kundera once wrote, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. The organization Memorial is dedicated to exactly that, memory. It was established 
in the late 1980s in the former Soviet Union by, among others, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Andrei Sakharov and the tireless human rights advocate Elena Semskova, who actually is present here today. So, Elena, please rise. Initially, the purpose of Memorial was to document the oppression and atrocities under communist rule, so that these crimes would always be remembered. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the organization broadened its scope, also documenting human rights abuses as they occurred in Russia. Even though Memorial itself was temporarily tolerated by the government. Its members repeatedly suffered repercussions and assaults. As we all remember, Natalia Estemirova, who oversaw the memorial office in Chechnya, was brutally murdered in 2009 while documenting war crimes committed by Russian forces in the Second Chechen War. By classifying legitimate and normal civil society efforts as activities of foreign agents, Russian authorities have given themselves a legal grip on activities not to the government's liking. As a legal entity, Memorial is now history. It was closed down by a court ruling in April 2022. However, the network of former staff members and supporters of the liquidated organization is still active. It is now of paramount importance that Memorial's unique archives of past and current state crimes are preserved for the future. We must also make sure that the main lesson of Memorial's 35-year-long struggle for truth is never be forgotten. By recording the dark chapters of our history, we allow ourselves to learn from the past and prevent mistakes from being repeated. Memorial was determined to tell the true history of abuse, oppression, and war crimes. Such truths, I am sorry to say, are seen as an enemy of state in present-day Russia. We are honored to have the chair of Memorial's board of directors with us here today, Mr. Jan Raczynski, and his slogan is, nobody plans to give up. And I turn finally to the Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine. Represented on stage by the chair of its board of directors, Alexandra Matvichuk. The Center for Civil Liberties has declared that it wants to reinforce the principle of human dignity. Indeed, a very bold goal. More specifically, it wants to encourage civic activism in support of democracy, human rights, and rule of law. Back in 2007, when the Center for Civil Liberties was established, democracy and rule of law were not fully embedded in Ukraine. The years of newly won independence had seen both gains and setbacks in that respect. When the pro-Russian and increasingly authoritarian regime of former President Viktor Yanukovych cracked down on the peaceful pro-democracy protesters 
in Kiev's Independence Square in 2013, the Center for Civil Liberties launched its Euromaidan SOS initiative. The initiative had a double aim, documenting the government's human rights violation and providing legal assistance to the victims. The Centre also began to monitor the conduct of various government agencies, such as the police and security services, in order to hold them accountable for their actions and encourage institutional reforms. Last but not least, Euromaidan SOS developed interactive maps which made it possible to track and force disappearance of human rights activists, democracy advocates, and investigative journalists. After Viktor Yanukovych was removed from office in February 2014, and Russia carried out its illegal annexation of Crimea, the Center for Civil Liberties turned its attention to the human rights situation there and in the contested Donbas region. As the first human rights group to send mobile monitoring teams into Crimea and Donbas, the Center for Civil Liberties compiled lists of political prisoners and human rights violations that were later exchanged with other national and international human rights watchdogs. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, these mobile monitoring teams were given a new and daunting task to identify and document war crimes committed by Russian and pro-Russian forces on Ukrainian soil. The Center for Liber Civil Liberties has advocated that Ukraine become affiliated with the International Criminal Court. It has collaborated with international partners to collect evidence of, human, of Russian human rights violations and war crimes, thereby paving the ground for future legal processes against the war criminals. Through its work today, Center for Civil Liberties is preparing for peace and justice tomorrow. One day when hostilities have ceased, Ukraine will continue its efforts to develop democracy and rule of law. The Center for Civil Liberties intends to be at the forefront in that process. The Norwegian Nobel Committee firmly believes that this year's three Peace Prize laureates represent the vital role played by civil society in achieving and maintaining peace. In Oslo and in Stockholm, we meet today to celebrate all the Nobel Prizes. We meet at a time when democracy and freedom are in decline globally, and when there is a brutal war of aggression in Europe with disruptive global effects. In the face of this multitude of crises and challenges, the world needs dedicated scientists and people who relentlessly seek the truth and push the boundaries for our knowledge. And the world needs those admirable individuals and groups of people who are, who at great personal sacrifice challenge repressive authorities and stand up against aggression in pursuit of democracy, human rights, and peace. 
the Norwegian Nobel Committee is proud to honor Ales Bialyatsky Memorial and the Center for Civil Liberties for their contributions and you, uh, to peace and human dignity at these very troubling times. Thank you. I thought uh, she did a beautiful summary of the significance of these three individual um, organizations or people. Um, it's interesting that each one is represent, uh, representing either her husband or the two organizations themselves. I have two more videos. The next one is going to um, be uh, a, a, a selection of the comments by these representatives. And it occurs on a streaming um, uh, service uh, uh, called Democracy Now. Some of you know about Democracy Now. Amy Goodman and, uh, and a partner whose name, Gonzalez, I've forgotten his first name, Rodrigo Gonzalez, uh, have been broadcasting uh, Democracy Now for a long time. And uh, they represent uh, clearly a very progressive left-wing perspective. But I thought this, uh, this next one, which we'll get to in a moment, um, is especially telling because it's in the words of the actual representatives who, uh, who have, uh, you'll see them receiving the awards and then giving, uh, we'll hear excerpts from their remarks. Um, whoop, that's, uh, I don't know, we should go to the, this just, hmm. Okay, there we are. We won't begin quite yet. So we will hear them. And then the last brief video is about Memorial and uh, what the Russians have done to that organization or the Russian authorities. So we can begin right now. The Nobel Peace Prizes were given out Saturday on International Human Rights Day in Oslo, Norway. The awards went to the Ukrainian organization Center for Civil Liberties, the Russian group Memorial, and Alas Bielatsky, imprisoned human rights activists in Belarus. The Nobel Peace Prize ceremony came nearly 10 months after Russia invaded Ukraine. On the same day as the Nobel ceremony, Russia launched a drone strike on the Ukrainian port city of Odessa, cutting power to one and a half million people. Millions of Ukrainians face a winter without heat or electricity after Russian strikes on civilian infrastructure. We begin today's show airing excerpts of the speeches from Saturday's Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. This is Alexandra Matvachuk, the head of the Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine. We are receiving the Nobel Peace Prize during the war started by Russia. This war has been going on for eight years, nine months and 21 days. For millions of people, such words as shelling, torture, deportation, filtration camps have become commonplace. But there are no words which can express the pain of a mother who lost her newborn son in a shelling of the maternity ward. A moment ago, she was caressing her baby, calling him by his name, breastfeeding him, inhaling his smell, and the next moment a Russian missile destroyed her entire universe, and now her beloved and her longed for baby lies in the smallest coffin in the world. How can we make human rights meaningful again? Peace, progress, and human rights are inextricably linked. A state that kills journalists, imprisons activists, or disperses peaceful demonstrations poses a threat not only to its citizens. Such a state poses a threat to the entire region and peace in the world as a whole. Therefore, the world must adequately respond to systemic violations. In political decision 
decision-making, human rights must be as important as economic benefits or security. These approach should be applied in foreign policy too. Russia, that has been consistently destroying its own civil society, illustrates this very well. But the countries of the democratic world have long turned a blind eye to this. They continued to shake hands with the Russian leadership, build gas pipelines and conduct business as usual. For decades, Russian troops have been committing crimes in different countries, but they always got away with this. The world has not even adequately responded to the act of aggression and annexation of Crimea, which were the first such cases in post-war Europe. Russia believed that they could do whatever they want. Now Russia is deliberately inflicting harm on civilians aiming to stop our resistance and occupy Ukraine. Russian troops intentionally destroy residential buildings, churches, schools, hospitals, shell evacuation corridors, but people in filtration camps carry out forced deportations, kidnap, torture and kill people in occupied territories. The Russian people will be responsible for this disgraceful page of their history and their desire to forcefully restore the former empire. People of Ukraine want peace more than anyone else in the world. But peace cannot be reached by country under attack laying down its arms. This would not be peace, but occupation. After the liberation of Bucci, we found a lot of civilians murdered in the streets and courtyards of their homes. These people were unarmed. We must stop pretending deferred military threats are, quote, political compromises. The democratic world has grown accustomed to making concessions to dictatorships, and that is why the willingness of the Ukrainian people to resist Russian imperialism is so important. We will not leave people in occupied territories to be killed and tortured. People's lives cannot be called political compromise. Fighting for peace does not mean yield to pressure of the aggressor. It means protecting people from its cruelty. In this war, we are fighting for freedom in every meaning of the word, and for it we are paying for the highest possible price. We, Ukrainian citizens of all nationalities, should not discuss our right to a sovereign and independent Ukrainian state and development of the Ukrainian language and culture. As human beings, we do not need approval of our right to determine our own identity and make our own democracy. This is not a war between two states. It is a war of two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. We are fighting for the opportunity to build a state in which everyone's rights are protected. Authorities are accountable, courts are independent, and the police do not beat peaceful students' demonstrations in Central Square of the capital. We do not want our children to go through wars and suffering. So as parents, we have to assume the responsibility and act, not to shift it on our children. Humanity has a chance to overcome global crisis and build a new philosophy of life. It's time to assume the responsibility. We don't know how much of the time we still have. And since this Nobel Peace Prize ceremony takes place during the war, I will allow myself to reach out to people around the world and call for solidarity. You don't have to be Ukrainians to support Ukraine. It is enough just to be humans. That was Oleksandra Matvichuk, the head of the Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine, which received the Nobel Peace Prize on Saturday. The Russian Human Rights Group Memorial also won the Nobel Peace Prize. This is the Russian human rights activist Jan Ryczynski of Memorial. Memorial's human rights defense work has included the search for the missing investigation of extrajudicial executions and reporting on forced disappearances. It has included years of help for refugees and the forcibly displaced due to these conflicts. Memorial has been carrying out the monitoring of political repression and legal assistance for political prisoners. Today, the number of political prisoners in Russia is more than the total number in all of the Soviet 
Union at the beginning of the period of the perestroika in the 1980s. The struggle for freedom has continued since the Soviet regime. Here, the past and the present come together. In the Soviet Empire, any attempts by peoples to fight for national independence or even simply manifest a national consciousness that did not fit the Soviet ideological dogma were declared to be bourgeois nationalism and were brutally suppressed. After the collapse of the USSR, the states that formed on this territory had their own historical narratives that did not coincide with the official Soviet historical mythology. And soon after Vladimir Putin came to power, the new Russian leadership and his ideological servants began violent and aggressive memory wars against their neighbors, Estonia, Latvia, Ukraine, while fully using old Soviet stereotypes and labels. Of course, this was done for the sake not of historical truth, but for their own political interests. The result was that the Russian propaganda against nationalism and what Putin's regime called Banderaism, after a far right-wing Ukrainian nationalist, became the ideological justification for the insane and criminal war of aggression against Ukraine. One of the first victims of this madness was the historical memory of Russia itself. Indeed, in order to pass off aggression against a neighboring country as fighting fascism, it was necessary to twist the minds of Russian citizens by swapping the concepts of fascism and anti-fascism. Now the Russian mass media refer to the unprovoked armed invasion of a neighboring country, the annexation of territories, terror against civilians in the occupied areas, and war crimes as justified by the need to fight fascism. Hatred is incited against Ukraine, its culture and language are publicly declared declared inferior, and the Ukrainian people are deemed not to have a separate identity from Russians. Resistance to Russia is called fascism. Such propaganda absolutely contradicts the historical experience of Russia and devalues and distorts the memory of the truly anti-fascist war of 1941 to 1945 and the Soviet soldiers who fought against Hitler. The words Russian soldier in the minds of many people will now be associated not with those who fought against Hitler, but those who sowed death and destruction on Ukrainian soil. That was Jan Ryczynski of the Russian Human Rights Group Memorial, one of the three recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize this year. The third winner was Alas Bielatsky, a human rights activist imprisoned in Belarus. He was detained there after the 2020 protests against the re-election of President Alexander Lukashenko. Bielatsky remains in jail without trial and faced his up to 12 years if convicted. At the Nobel Awards ceremony in Oslo Saturday, his wife Natalia Pinchuk delivered the speech on behalf of her imprisoned husband. I want to express my profound gratitude to the Norwegian Nobel Committee, whose decision strengthened Alice and his committee to stand firm in his conviction and gives hope to all Belarusians that they can count on the democratic world's solidarity in the fight for their rights, no matter the length of struggle. Not only is Alice in prison, but there are also thousands of Belarusians, tens of thousands of repressed, unjustly imprisoned for their civic action and beliefs across the country. Hundreds of thousands have been forced to flee the country for the mere reason that they wanted to live in a democratic state. Unfortunately, the war of the authorities against their own people, language, history, and democratic values has been waged in Belarus for years. I say this here with supreme pain and vigilance as today's political and military events threaten Belarus with the loss of statehood and independence. Unfortunately, the authorities choose to engage with society through the use of force, grenades, batons, stun guns, endless arrests and torture. There is no effort or talk about national compromise or dialogue. They persecute girls and boys, women and men, minors and elderly people. The inhumane face of system reigns in Belarusian prisons, especially for those who dreamed of being free people.
In light of such a situation, it is no coincidence that the authorities arrested Alice and his associates from the Humane Rights Center, Vyazna, for their democratic beliefs and human rights activities. Marfa Rapkova, Valiancin Stefanovic, Uladzimir Lapkovic, Leonid Sudalenka, Andrei Chapiuk, and other human rights defenders are behind bars. Alice could not convey the text of his speech from prison, but he managed to tell me just a couple of words. Therefore, I will share with you his thoughts, both the latest and those recorded earlier. These are fragments of his previous statements, writings, and reflections. Here are his reflections about the past and future of Belarus, about human rights, about the fate of peace and freedom. So, I pass the floor to Alice. In my homeland, the entirety of Belarus is in a prison. Journalists, political scientists, trade union leaders are in jail. There are many of my acquaintances and friends among them. The court works like a conveyor belt. Convicts are transported to penal colonies and new waves of political prisoners take their place. This award belongs to all my human rights defender friends, all civic activists, tens of thousands of Belarusians who have gone through beatings, torture, arrests, prison. This award belongs to millions of Belarusian citizens who stood up and took action in the streets and online to defend their civil rights. It highlights the dramatic situation and struggle for human rights in this country. I recently had a short dialogue. When will you be released? They asked me. I am already free in my soul, was my reply. So uh, I think we have a real feeling for both the uh, representatives, their organizations or spouse, and, um, uh, and the significance of it. I, I wanted to note the modesty of the royalty in Norway. <laughs> um, they are uh, very functional. Where were the white ties? No white ties. Can you only imagine the people who rent those tuxedos out making a fortune at, on the 10th of, of December in Stockholm, but no white ties there. They did have a banquet, but I don't have any pictures of it. This last brief video takes place a little about a year earlier uh, in Moscow, and it'll explain itself once we begin. I have to get to the next. I don't know what the 75% means, but there we are. And we will start this briefly. This In is the latest blow to Russia's dwindling civil society, the Supreme Court there has ordered the liquidation of one of the country's most prominent human rights groups. Memorial was founded in 1989 by Soviet dissidents, including Nobel Peace Prize laureate Andrei Zakharov. The group defends the rights of political prisoners and helps victims of Soviet-era repression. Prosecutors said the organization violated a law on foreign agents on multiple occasions. Memorial and its supporters say the accusations are politically motivated. With more on this, let's bring in Bos Moscow based journalist Felix Light. Felix, welcome to DW. Why did the Russian Supreme Court shut down this organization? 
Well, Rebecca, this, as many sort of things are in the Russian judicial system, is sort of a story in two halves. You know, on the one hand, we have sort of technical violations of Russia's very controversial foreign agents law. That's the sort of the the, the technical sort of premise on which Memorial has been just shut down today. But of course, you know, in general, this case is seen in sort of a slightly different light. And Memorial has been famous for a couple of things, but most importantly, uh, is sort of investigating these Stalinist crimes, the repressions of the 1930s. And that is very much up set sort of uh, much of the Russian sort of contemporary political establishment and significantly the security services who are very, very influential in the current Russian government. And so what we saw today and from the sort of the prosecutors who spoke in the Supreme Court was almost an indictment of these attempts to sort of memorialize the Stalinist crimes. Prosecutors argued that Russians shouldn't pay attention to these uh, sort of the, the, to these crimes. They shouldn't be, as they said, ashamed and they should sort of... Uh, revel in their sort of their the, the 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 legacy of the victory in world war ii so i think this was a sort of a case that really struck at the heart of the sort of the the the, the rhetoric of much of the sort of the the, the current russian political system around mem memorializing stalin's role in uh, in the second world war and really trying to sort of gloss over a little bit these the crimes that that that, that period was sort of was famous for as well now, Memorial says it's been a target of the same repression it's been trying to protect people from and that it, the move is politically motivated. Are they right? Well, certainly many, many people have said that. You know, it's 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 very difficult to sort of to, to make a sweeping judgment, but certainly I think Memorial's allies are clear that this is about sort of overstepping the lines, the red lines sort of delineated by the Kremlin. Of course, Memorial was not just sort of famous for its work on in, in history. Uh, you know, in more recent years, as sort of Russia took its authoritarian turn, Memorial was very active in producing very sort of uh, human rights orientated projects, sort of supporting uh, political prisoners, you know, people jailed at protests in Russia. Russia. So, you know, there were almost any number of things on which Memorial could have sort of uh, sufficiently irritated influential security services or the Kremlin uh, sort of through its actions. So I think it's, it's, it's difficult to say precisely what this is motivated by, but there is certainly no shortage of potential causes for, for irritation from the Kremlin with Memorial. Now, Felix, this is a Supreme Court ruling. Can it be appealed? Well, technically, I suppose, yes, whether it can be taken to sort of the European Court of Human Rights, it can be taken to the European justice system. But I mean, the Russian justice system has generally, although it is sort of nominally subscribed to things like the European Human Court, uh, Court of Human Rights, it does not generally respect their, their verdicts. And so we may see this case go on. But I think sort of nominally for Memorial as a sort of a legal organization, this is very much the end of the road. It's possible that the organization will find some way of surviving in future, but it will not be as a sort of a legally constituted civil organization as it has been in the past. Right, Felix Light, journalist in Moscow, thank you very much for your time. I can only imagine Putin taking this, uh, uh, honoring the, the, uh, the European Court of Justice and that sort of thing. Um, so that, that's the, the talk. This is the presentation on the Peace Prize of 2022. Uh, incidentally, if I can get the next slide, all of this, so much information of which I've sampled is available through NobelPrize.org. And that's a picture I took on my birthday when I visited Stockholm in 2015. And there's a museum there, and if you get to Stockholm, it's a fascinating kind of hands-on museum of Nobel Prize winners in the past. Uh, so that ceremony, both ceremonies, the one in Stockholm and the one here, is really uh, available online through the Nobel uh, Prize uh, organization, the foundation. They each are about an hour and thirty, hour and three quarters long. And so we've just excerpted some of it. So um, next year, there are six more awards. The first week of October, people will get uh, phone calls at opportune and inopportune times. They're usually uh, kind of mid-morning in Stockholm, which is about 5 a.m. on the East Coast and about 2 a.m. on the West Coast in the United States if Americans are gonna win any more awards, which they might. Um, and so stay tuned. Thanks for coming.